Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here in the tour orchestra. We're all mad TED geeks, and uh, that's what we do after each rehearsal. We blind each other by, uh, with our favorite TED Talks. And I just thought I'd like, before we do a couple of numbers, to um, talk to you about some of the ideas behind the tour orchestra and show you a couple of other projects I've been involved in to give you a kind of context. Um, <clears throat> really, uh, what the tour orchestra grew out of was, was kind of dissatisfaction, a kind of a existential crisis I had in the 90s about uh, music. Why do we write music? What's it for? Why do we use the instruments that we choose? Uh, why do, does popular music often choose the confessional mode? And is it really just about emotionally manipulating the audience to tell them your story and get, kind of get them on your side or make them feel happy or sad? And every time I went to the piano or the guitar, I would find myself um, really kind of reproducing habits and patterns that I had. I started to get really uh, uncomfortable with this, and uh, I, I wanted to find a way of breaking my own habit. But also, more than that, I wanted to find a, a reason for composing in the first place. I'd kind of lost my interest in these, in the kind of songwriter mode, in a way. Um, so I started to think, well, what actually makes human beings unique in the first place? Why does the universe bother to rearrange its valuable resources momentarily into us? Uh, is there anything about us that's actually special that makes me different to any other arrangements of molecules? Well, there's kissing. That's kind of different for us than any other arrangement of animals. There's cooking and there's religion. But I didn't really want to take any of those as my inspiration point. But the thing that I really found most interesting is our urge to look outside our own sense data. Um, this seems pretty particularly unique to us. I think it really all starts here with the lever, an attempt to amplify our own strength. But this is one I really like, 3000 BC, Mesopotamia. These type of tweezers first appear, probably for picking lice off each other. The urge to attenuate. This urge to kind of look outwards and look inwards ends up with the microscope and the telescope. And here we have the fabulous uh, level telescope at Jodrell Bank, which I've just been doing some work at and I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, some other ideas that were uh, really important to me when I was growing up, so I was given a book about Buckminster Fuller, and he had this idea called ephemeralization, which he means uh, to make the most out of the least. There's a story that a student came to him with a, a building, and he said to the student, how much do the foundations weigh? And the student had no idea, and he said, well, I can't really tell you how good this building is unless you can tell me what percentage of the building is actually useful and is covering this surface. And uh, his solution to this was to create the GED sick dome where he, he really made the most out of the least and covered the maximum space with the least materials with this wonderful mathematical solution. Uh, John Cage was another book I was given when I was young. You can tell where it is all coming from, <laughs> from my being given books when I was young. And uh, of course, his prepared piano was the first time I'd seen an instrument that had been extended beyond the designer's intention, shall we say. <clears throat> I'm going to show you the first uh, project here, which might have some resonance with what I've been talking about. It's called the Optophonic Lunophone. Um, I was a particularly noisy child, and my mother told me when I was about five or six that it was possible to hear the stars sing if you concentrated long enough. It was a very good ploy to get me to be quiet <laughs> and uh, get me to be out of the house. Uh, Later in life, a friend of mine gave me a book called Experiments in the Next Dimension, uh, Circuits for the Home Paranormal Experimenter, or something. <laughs> and uh, in it, it had a small circuit about uh, converting light into sound. And I thought, oh, if I put one of those in a telescope, then perhaps I could listen to the light from stars, and I could at last hear the stars sing. I, um, I made a model. And uh, I, had, I bought a telescope, and I put my sensor in the telescope, and I pointed it at a star, and the amplifier blew up, and it, <laughs> the chip flew into two pieces inside the amplifier. I thought, hmm, something, I'm going to have to spend a bit more time with this. Anyway, the first sensor that I made could pick up a, the uh, invisible sounds of a remote control from about half a mile away, and did nothing when I pointed it at a star. And I spent the next two and a half years uh, am making the sensor uh, more powerful. Every night I'd be in the back garden with a telescope waiting for the skies to clear with a new sensor with a pair of headphones like some kind of high-tech peeping Tom. I don't know what the neighbors thought. Um, eventually, anyway, I made this instrument. It comprises of six telescopes, each with a sensor in the eyepiece. They all return to a central control panel that allows you to play in real time 
with the, uh, with the stars. It depends, of course, on the state of the atmosphere and where you're looking at in the sky. Um, the sound that you're hearing now is the star Vega, which is directly above us. <clears throat> I was asked to contribute a piece to the National Portrait Gallery to pick a portrait to respond to. And there was a portrait of an amateur astronomer called William Huggins, who in 1896, uh, I think it was, he did the most amazing thing. He put a spectrograph on the end of a telescope. And in that act, he showed the world that stars were in fact suns and were made of exactly the same elements. Uh, the sound we're now hearing is uh, the sound of sunlight coming through dappled trees. I was imagining that William must have spent many hours sitting, contemplating uh, how he was going to observe the next star, because in Birmingham, where I come from, I'd spent six months at a time waiting for the sky to clear enough for me to uh, even look at the star, let alone test anything down. Um, this performance was in 2004. It was all coincided to uh, end with the telescope looking at the light of the full moon, which allows kind of much purer tones to occur. It's a direct translation in light. It's a kind of light microphone. Uh, it oscillates air pressure at the frequency of the incoming light. Um, and this was the control panel that allowed you to kind of play it, or either you can sequence the, between the six uh, telescopes as well. Um, this was a concept proposal I was asked to do for the uh, uh, London Science Museum, and it was called Big Ideas, and I thought there was n really no bigger idea than Einstein's attempt to unify the four fundamental forces. And uh, I, I really like that Einstein uh, says that he liked to think in images, and he says that he couldn't afford to buy a clock, but he could put a clock at every point in the universe in his mind, which kind of makes him the ultimate uh, ephemeralization granddaddy to me. He could do everything with nothing. Um, he uh, liked to say that uh, he, he's exploring the quantum physics relativity dichotomy, uh, the, the rules of the big things and the small things don't quite coincide. And he liked to make images for this, and he said that relativity was smooth and like marble, it was self-consistent, and the closer you got to it, the more self-similar similar it was. But quantum physics was more wood, like wood, like a tree. It was knotty and unfamiliar the closer you got to it. And he envisaged this in his mind as a tree growing out of a marble piazza. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to make a sculpture in honor of Einstein's failed experiment in uniting the, f the forces that visualized his uh, marble tree? So I worked with the uh, University of Aston and a, uh, a programmer called Lucy Bastin, a professor there, to try and visualize this tree. And we uh, eventually came up with this fourfold symmetry, one for each of the fundamental forces. And the directions of space-time, and we made a little moquette with a three-dimensional printer, and we made a mock of what it would look like. It would have a little indentation. The only curve in the place would be a little tiny indentation under the tree to imply Newton's apple, and you might be able to place an apple there and contemplate the presence of higher dimensions. It's uh, paved in what looks like an Islamic tiling design, but in fact it's a two-dimensional shadow of a higher-dimensional hypercube. Uh, suggesting, as string theory does, that uh, maybe looked at from a higher dimension, we might be able to reconcile these forces. Um, this is a project I just did with uh, Jodrell Bank and an artist called Taswar Bashir. I had the fantastic opportunity to work with Jodrell Bank, and because uh, I'm completely geek pride and completely out as geek, I uh, love uh, uh, Jodrell Bank and. Uh, the sounds of the universe has often fascinated me, but particularly the sound of pulsars, which are giant collapsed stars. Imagine the sun collapsed to the size of a city. They're rotating and emitting two beams of light, and as the beam of light passes or radiation, you, you get a click, and we can listen in with radio telescopes to this click. But some of those pulsars are rotating so fast that they produce musical notes, and to me this is like the harmony of space. It's the way the universe chooses to decide, uh, divide the scale. So we, we decided um, it was for the Asian Triennial, and we were lucky enough to get access to some recordings by his management company of Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, the iconic uh, Kuali singer. It's a form of uh, devotional Sufi music. And they allowed us to have access to this and do what we wanted with it. And we decided that we were going to put Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan exactly where he really belonged, in the center of the universe. And we had these wonderful recordings, such as the first 10 million years of the universe uh, raised uh, uh, the, fir the first 10 million years of the Big Bang, uh, the echo of the Big Bang raised 55 octaves uh, as a kind of substrate that we could allow him to sing on. 
but there were these fabulous coincidences. We, we wanted to pay respect to each side of this equation, to the kind of science and to and the koali. We, uh, we decided we, we, there was no way we were going to change the pitch of anything. That would just be rude to change the pitch, the frequency. The pulsar would be somewhat like playing God, and it would be uh, incredibly disrespectful to Sufi music if we auto-tuned him. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so we looked for commonalities in the background radiation of the universe and in the sounds of the universe that had just happened to be in tune with this uh, introduction to a, a classic Sufi song called Allah Hu. Um, it was based on the Conference of the Birds, a big uh, Sufi poem uh, in which 30 birds finally arrive at the edge of known space. Uh, we chose uh, this design which had 31 uh, segments. We made this piece of software that had a phrase, musical phrase per segment that could go together in any order and in any combination and it would be continuously composed by the incoming radio data, a kind of infinite koala. The sound that you're hearing here is the sound of the solar wind. We haven't changed the tuning of anything. And what you're hearing here is we, we said to Tim O'Brien, the astrophysicist, can you uh, look into the universe and find pulsars that are rotating at these frequencies that would go in the scale of this song? And he sent us back recordings. These chords are compilations of uh, different pulsars that happen to be rotating at those frequencies. We then used um, Nusrat's voice um, to give a sense of, uh, we were looking for a sense of silent awe, a kind of feeling that you get when you look at the sky at night. Uh, the system self-composes and alters uh, a pattern depending on the incoming data. This sound, is, uh, which is like birds tweeting, is in fact radio waves bouncing around the atmosphere of Jupiter. And there are some sounds, which is the um, Cassini probe uh, entering the atmosphere of Io. Um, and here's us geeking out, me and Tazwa in front of the Hubble telescope, so it's, it's quite a wonderful thing to see this every day. Um, modified tour orchestra is a kind of combination of all these ideas somehow. I, I was looking at um, a speak and spell machine in 1998, this uh, orange machine here, made by Texas Instruments in 1978. Uh, first time a talking uh, chip was ever used, digitized human voice. And I, I was trying to find a material to work with that had been hidden and was now revealed, a kind of a, uh, using this idea that humans like to part the veil somehow, and I was thinking, I don't want to really do this metaphorically, I want to actually find some material which is, was really once hidden and unknown and try working with that. And I'd been playing with this toy, this toy and uh, connecting parts of its circuit together that were never meant to go together, and it started to produce strange sounds. And at first I was using it as a way of getting novel sounds. Um, eventually though, after I'd worked with it for a while, I, I started to realized that it was in fact an instrument that I could use. <clears throat> and this process of people adapting uh, instruments could really be seen to begin here with Leader Forrest in 1906, and he invented the Audion vacuum tube, which without which none of us electronic musicians would have any amplification at all. And he found that when he was putting his fingers on the circuits, I don't really know why he was doing that with such high voltage things, but the circuits would start to emit strange sounds. And uh, he was uh, conducting electricity into his own body. Um, this lovely uh, gentleman, Reed Gazala, uh, pushed an amplifier into a drawer in, in the 1960s, a small uh, battery-operated amplifier, and made a connection accidentally. It started to cause feedback, and um, he became obsessed with this process. He gave it a name, circuit bending. Um, circuit bending is kind of ultimate democratic art form. Anyone can do it, and expertise is probably actually bad because it kind of restricts the... Um, explorative process. If each one of us uh, in this room were given a Casio SK-1 sampler and told to randomly connect parts of its circuit together while making sounds, each one of us would end up creating a, a unique instrument that was tailored specifically to them. Um, I released this uh, single in 2002, which was made only with this instrument and nothing else. So I was trying to remove my idiot monkey hands from the keyboard, and it was a kind of rejection of structure and a rejection of kind of trying to manipulate the chords in some way. 
This has a great function that uh, you connect two parts of its brain together momentarily and it becomes completely confused and starts spitting out random pieces of noise. But sometimes it's noise, sometimes it's hum, sometimes it crashes, and sometimes it's these long, strange, evolving pieces of music. And it's kind of heartbreaking to turn it off. It's like its first chance to sing this song. It may never, ever sing it again. And um, I started loving this fact that I could make music that I didn't actually own. That was a, I couldn't say who owned it or who had made it. It was a kind of collage of this previously hidden information. I started performing with these instruments, making this kind of um, comp, uh, random compositions. I really loved it and thought it was really exciting, but I'm not sure it was quite so exciting for the audience. <laughs> um, this single came out and it cost £3.50 and it came with instructions how to make it yourself for a pound. So you could uh, make the album. This shows the inside of the first Speak and Spell uh, I was making. It can now kind of generate random cut-up poetry, or they can chatter away together uh, in synchronized uh, random poetry. Um, this is a good reason why, why expertise is not always the best option. Uh, this machine is another speaking educational toy, and it could... Uh, uh, it had about 40 different uh, speaking phrases, but the modifications allow hundreds and hundreds of new electronic sounds to come out of it, strange electronic loops that repeat. I, I rather proudly showed it to an engineer, and he said, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got kind of obsessed with this process, and uh, I eventually realized that what I, was, what I wanted to do was go back to using these toys as instruments, but bring back some structure, which was impossible with just two hands. And uh, I, I, I eventually formed a band, and um, we started uh, performing in a way that would allow structure. Um, one of our high points was that we got asked to premiere an album, which we hadn't really finished writing at the City Hall in Hong Kong. Uh, it was called Plastic Planet. Our, there were some, in England, what, uh, often journalists, they just ask about the evil Barbie doll. And in China, they were more concerned with asking us about the subtle undercurrents of environmentalism. Um, the, uh, this phrase, uh, here is us at Hong, Hong Kong. This phrase had haunted me since 1978 when um, Design for the Real World was a book I'd read. It introduced me to Buckminster Fuller by creating whole species of permanent garbage to clutter up the landscape and by choosing materials and processes that pollute the air we breathe, designers have become a dangerous breed. And in China, they were kind of very happy to talk to me primarily about, about this. Now, I'd really like to invite the toy orchestra onto stage. Uh, are you there, lads? Who have we got? We've got Sean, Graham, Darren, and Lawrence. And uh, we'd like to perform for you a short, happy track. It's based around uh, a series of tunes which are inside this toy here. Would you care to show it, Darren? We don't really know what it's called. We call it the canteen scene. It seems to be a toy designed to program children to sell fried chicken. <laughs> um, is everybody in? Yep. We'd like to play for you a grand occasion.
Darren uh, found this toy, which was a book that you could put little uh, pieces in the side and it would enable you to read a story. And there was one module which was about nursery rhymes and you could point to a... a uh, ...say that word. And we, we, we looked through it for uh, nursery rhymes that had words within them that were in tune with tracks that we were working on and we completely ignored the narrative whatsoever. And we just went for the words that were in tune and looked for, for whatever it said. And it turned out that Humpty Dumpty uh, said some rather unusual things about the decline of empire. <laughs> <coughs> Great King's Fall.
Um, we've got one more number for you, if that's okay. Uh, is that a yes? <laughs> um, uh, this number is called Black Star, and it features uh, the insides of an educational speaking toy put into this ghetto blaster. And um, it also features uh, Hula Barbie. There we go. Getting anything out of Mr. Blackstar. Let's see if it's working. Yeah. Picture. Here's the Black Star. That's the Black Star. That's the Black Star.
I'd like to thank Alderberg for inviting us very much and if anybody wants to uh, uh, get a close look at any of the toys or have anything explained to them, please pop down and have a chat with us. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs>